housing of the boy. I think this today is the the moment we we take the prayer series to the next level. I think this is this is a prayer that that I consider essential to people of faith, or is going to prove to be essential to people of faith. And yet, I'm also very aware that this this is a challenging subject. It's actually one of the top three or four reasons I started the channel in the first place. So I think we're kind of coming to the crux of the matter. But I wouldn't be surprised if some find this challenging. And I think I can demonstrate scripturally the relevance of it. But if, if you find it challenging, then, um, you know, please just let it wash over you. Watch the film. Let it wash through you. And then if you need to, just don't be afraid to just park it. And let that seed be planted and just, just wait till the moment is right. I think allowing it to take its time in you may be appropriate for some people. Oddly though, having said that, I think this is also a prayer that would be relevant for people who wouldn't consider themselves people of faith. Um, possibly people who would, who would call themselves A or, or agnostic. People of different faiths. People who might be of a faith where they, they consider Christ to have only been a prophet. Or perhaps that, that Christ isn't entirely what scripture says he is. Um, or that new age kind of slant where, you know, then people might say, yeah, okay, Jesus existed, but he was, he was just a good man, a good teacher, something of a guru. And so this prayer will prove to be a prayer that, that actually Anyone from those categories, they could pray into this prayer as well. There'd be nothing lost. They wouldn't be compromising any of their views. And there'd still be tre potentially tremendous value in it. Now, I'm also aware that for people of faith, this could prove to be quite a controversial subject. And I'm, I'm very aware that I'm, I'm now in danger of causing offence. I think there's a chance I'm going to get some pushback on this particular installment in the series. I can already imagine people watching the film and thinking, how dare you? Or I've been a member, a practicing member of this or that denomination, or I'm a member of this or that church for the last however many decades. But I think I can demonstrate that this scripturally, this is a prayer worthy of considering incorporating into your theology. As usual, um, it's going to, we're going to be basing heavily on scripture. And the whole thing is born of the passage in Matthew 16. And it's the, it's pre-transfiguration. It's Caesarea Philippi. And the reason I'm coming at, the, at this from this angle is I remember reading that passage. I've read it many times. And then I remember reading it one day and just having this, this moment of revelation. So let's dive into the scripture and we'll come to, we'll start to unpack it and we'll see where we're going with this. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the son of man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Now I think people are familiar with this passage, and I think they're probably predicting, expecting that I'm, I'm going to be taking this down the route of verse 15, which is, who do you say I am? And I see people get very understandably and rightfully quite excited about that verse and they that they'll have workshops on who do you say I am? That's not where we're going at all. We're going to go back to the beginning and we're going to just unpack it slowly. And there's a few things we're going to bring out. I quite like the fact that in the Greek with the verse 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, and again, we don't want to get caught up in Greek tenses, but this is one place I think it's relevant because I think a more accurate translation of the Greek might be, he was asking his disciples. 
I think we should get a sense that that it wasn't just a one-off question, that it was he was pushing them. He was getting them to dig. And maybe they were uncomfortable. And I'll explain why. You see, the beginning of it, when Jesus came to Caesarea, to, to the region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, if you're anything like me, when you read a, a, a verse of scripture and, and there's a place or a, something that doesn't make sense, I tend to skip over it and I tend to think, well, that's, I don't know where that is. That's not relevant to me. So I had a dig. The region of Caesarea Philippi, this isn't Christ taking the apostles on an outing. This isn't a day trip. This isn't, we're going to uh, Disneyland. This, there's, there's relevance in this. You see, Caesarea Philippi uh, was a town north in the north, northern part of the Golan Heights. And it was at the southwest base of Mount Hermon. And it's in or around the region of Bashan. And to a first century Jew, they'd have known full well that historically this was, this was a place where there was a shrine to the Greek god Pan. Um, this was a place where arguably... I think historically and archaeologically, we've decided or discovered that there was a degree of child sacrifice, that there was a, this was a, this was a heartland of pagan worship. And I think, or I suspect the Greek god Pan, because Pan, part of his, the way he operated was he would strike fear or terror in the heart of the enemies. I think we get the word panic from it. Now, I'm not certain of that. I, I, I don't know where I've read that now. But let's back up. So, um, southwest base of Mount Hermon. Well, Mount Hermon is in the Book of Enoch, which people may say, well, that's, that's apocryphal, but it makes, it's mentioned three times in the New Testament. It's cited in the New Testament and sometimes it's cited without reference. So my sense is that the first or second century writers, they didn't feel the need to elucidate what they were referencing because they, they just assumed their readers would have known what they meant. And and so in, in, in Genesis 6, where you have the divine rebellion, the angels rebel against God, come down to earth, and it's the beginning of the proliferation of iniquity throughout mankind. Well, that pact to rebel against God and to, shall we say, sow the seed of iniquity in mankind, that, that was born at Mount Hermon. So Caesarea Philippi, at the base of Mount Hermon, to a first century Jew, they would they would have been aware of this. And interestingly, I think I, I read in Torah.com that, that Bashan in Proto-Semitic could be translated or, or, or sort of may have a root in serpent or dragon. Well, we know the, the sort of the modern day idea of Hasatan, the, the Satan figure, being a dragon or a serpent. And so the region of Bashan to a first century Jew would have, or could, could well have brought to mind this idea of serpent or dragon. Not a, historically, you know, not an encouraging image for a first century Jew. They would have felt uncomfortable. And it's also worthy of note that Caesarea Philippi to the Canaanites was known as Baal Gad or Baal Hermon. And, and that's the Baal is the, is the, the, um, I'm guessing probably Samuel Kings is the, um, the, uh, the pagan god that, um, well, it would have been the pagan god that Elijah w went up against. And, um, Baal, we, you know, the, the word Beelzebub, uh, um, another modern or archaic, but also modern, um, name for the Hasatan, um, is, is the root of it, the Baal, is, is the prince of, the sort of prince of the arrows, the prince of the fiery darts, the, the sort of, the, the prince of the demonic. And so the region of Baal Gad or Baal Hermon, now Caesarea Philippi, the shrine to the Greek god Pan, the foot of Mount Hermon where the divine rebellion took, took place. And I think in Deuteronomy 3 and Psalm 68, it's the region of the Rephaim. So to a first century Jew, when Christ announced to the apostles, we're going to Caesarea Philippi, I think they'd have been profoundly uncomfortable. I think we need to understand that Christ took the apostles to the, the center of pagan heartland. 
And then when he's there and they're not comfortable, and when he's there, he was asking his disciples, he asked them over and over again, who do the people say the son of man is? And I could almost imagine them, you know, kind of like not being comfortable where they are. They're kind of like, in, they're in bandit country. They're in the heart of, they don't want to be there. And then Christ starts saying, okay, who do people say I am? And he's digging. And I, I could almost imagine them going like, can we, like, shh, can we have this conversation like another day? Like, really? Here? Um, and yet, I guess cos cos cosmologically, the idea that, that Christ went there, towards the end of his ministry, it's almost like metaphorically he's kind of gone into this pagan heartland, took his shirt off and gone, you know who I am, here I am, what are you going to do about it? And then you have the transfiguration and Jerusalem and and then the crucifixion. It's almost like, and I don't know this, but, but, but metaphorically it's almost like Christ went there to pick a fight. I certainly heard uh, Michael Heiser talk about that that idea. So, they're not comfortable, and they've said who people say the Son of Man is, and then he looks at Peter and he says, who do you say I am? And again, it's quite possible that Peter's kind of like, can we keep it down? Like, really? I'm feeling really vulnerable here. And Christ is like, who do you say I am? And Peter's replied, and this is the verse people get very excited about, and understandably. And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. And every time I read that this passage, I'd be like, "Okay, great, love it." And then I, it was the next line. As usual, it's the line that's easy to, I think, easy to skip over. Jesus replied, "Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven." Well, the, the word in the Greek that Matthew chooses for revealed is apocalypto, the apocalypse, the revelation. It's, it's, it's a divine revelation or a mystical revelation. And so he's saying, blessed are you, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You couldn't have come to this yourself. You've not worked this out yourself. This isn't a power of deduction conclusion. You can only have come to this statement that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, by the grace of God, by the revelation, the apocalypto of God. Well, I'm left, I'm, I was left slightly taken aback by that. I'm like, really, Peter? Like, let, let's have a look at Peter's shall we say, status at this point. Peter was arguably, well, scripturally, one of the first apostles. I think um, most of the Gospels state that Peter was the first. I think the Gospel of John says that Andrew went to get Peter, so he was the second, but basically he was one of the first apostles. Um, he, in the Gospel of Mark, um, Peter, Andrew, James and John are brought into the apostleship fold, this is as soon as Christ has come out of the wilderness, post-baptism. And they've gone to Capernaum. And uh, Peter's there. And they've gone into the synagogue in Capernaum. And Christ has preached. It's probably the first thing they've seen him do. Certainly recorded in Mark. And they've seen him preach. And all the people were amazed. Now that theme runs throughout scripture. Then a, a person demonized um, with an unclean spirit. And Christ liberates, delivers the person from the unclean spirit. All the people were astonished. So Peter's seen this. And then they've gone back to his house, and, and this person they've relatively just met has healed his mother-in-law of a fever. And then that evening after sunset, so the Sabbath ended, all the people from the town brought all those who were sick and demon-possessed. And scripture records that the whole town were gathered at the door. And Jesus healed many of various diseases and cast out many demons. I'm going to come back to the demon thing in a moment, but this is, from a certain point of view, this is this is almost day one. And Peter's seen incredible sermon, miracle on his, a personal miracle on his mother-in-law, 
the healing of many sick and the casting out of demons. Then, and, and scripture goes, all the people were amazed, all the people were astonished. Then Peter seen the, the, the man um, cleansed of leprosy, arguably a messianic miracle. He's seen the healing of the man born blind, again, arguably a, one of the four messianic miracles. He's seen Christ go into Samaria. Now there was a huge separate, a huge divide as far as we understand. The people, the people of Judea and the people of Samaria just did not get on. And Christ goes there and he, he's invited to stay for a number of days. That would have probably, I'm guessing, would have probably blown a first century Jew away. Peter would have seen the, the account um, of Christ with the, the demon demons known as Legion. He would have seen the, uh, the, the, the deliverance of the person who uh, was recorded in scriptures being naked and not in his right mind, chained up, would attack people, would cut himself. So my point is that Peter has seen incredible signs and wonders. In fact, he's done incredible signs and wonders because uh, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, you've got the, the sending out of the 12. So you've got the apostles sent out in Christ's name to anoint the sick with oil and cast out demons. Then you've got the sending out of the 72, similar sort of thing. And they came back and, you know, they're all excited and they say, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So Peter's not, in, not only seen great signs and wonders, he's done great signs and wonders at this point in Caesarea Philippi. Peter was also one of the inner circle of Christ. And we know this because there's, there's at least three accounts I can think of where, where actually not all the apostles were allowed to be present and only Peter, James and John. I think it's always Peter, James and John. The healing of Jairus' daughter resurrection where only three apostles and the two parents were allowed in and scripture records everybody was laughing at him then you have obviously the transfiguration only peter james and john were, were accompanied jesus on the mount of transfiguration in gethsemane only peter james and john accompanied christ in gethsemane in what we call the passion and so peter arguably was this um th this inner circle of the inner circle I think scripture's fairly clear on that, or we can deduce that. All the way through scripture, scripture records that the people were amazed, the people were astonished, the people were terrified, the people were completely astonished, all the people were amazed and glorified God. Um, all the people were astonished and praised God. As a verse that says they were overwhelmed with amazement, I think the Greek is more akin to like astonishment beyond measure which many translations have got overwhelmed with amazement, but I love that astonishment beyond measure. And so you've got this sense that Peter has seen, along with many other people, so many signs and wonders. And then also bear in mind, Scripture just tells us the bits it tells us, but I don't think it's unfair to deduce. We, we know that, that uh, Christ was threatened in some towns and villages, and... You know, it's not a stretch to think that there might be some towns and villages where how many times were they chased out of a village? How many times did they find themselves up on a hillside at 11 o'clock at night, having just kind of like, you know, got away with their lives, perhaps? They've lit a fire. There's a couple of fish on the fire and they're sitting around just Jesus and them under the stars, middle of nowhere. I don't have this sense that they they kind of turned in for the night. I don't have this sense, or I have this sense that if, if I was sat with Christ on a hillside, fire, a couple of fish, stars out, for three years, how? who knows how many evenings, you'd be grilling him, you'd be talking to him, you'd be pressing him, asking him questions well into the night. Maybe even, you know, maybe even right through to the next morning. But like, what was that? What did you see? How did you do that? How do you know? What is this like? Is that what it feels like to be one with God? No one has ever asked me how it feels. So, the idea that, that Peter in Caesarea Philippi wasn't qualified with having seen all of this 
to come to the conclusion you are the Messiah, the Son of the, the, the Son of God, the Son of the Living God. Apologies. And actually, if all of that isn't convincing enough that 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 verse, "Blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah," for this was not revealed, apocalypto, this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You couldn't have come to this yourself, really, with everything he's seen. But this had to re be revealed to you by my Father in heaven. If you're still not convinced, so many accounts of Christ dealing with the sick, the lame, and the demonized, so many accounts have that the, the, the demons immediately knew who he was. And I've mentioned this before in another film. The only entity that seems to instantly recognize Jesus for who he was are demons. If we look at um, Luke 4, 41, demons came out of many shouting, you are the son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Messiah. Matthew 8, 29, the story of the two demoniacs, uh, the Gadarenes, and they shouted, what have you to do with us, son of God? First chapter of Mark says, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. He cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are the Holy One of God. Mark 3 goes on to say, And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, Jesus, they fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. Mark 5 says that when he saw Jesus, this is the demonized man, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, What have we to do with each other? Jesus, Son of the Most High God, in God's name, don't torment me. So, so often, Scripture records that when Jesus confronted a demonized person, either one of the first things they said was, you are the Son of God, or when Christ delivered the person from the demon, when the demon came out with a shriek, would, would shout or scream, you are the Son of God, you are the Son of the Most High. Peter would have witnessed that. Witness a demon declaring he was the son of God. And yet Christ tells us with the, that with, with all of that witnessing, with all of that empirical evidence, with all of that personal three years in his presence, his ability to make the statement, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, could only have come by divine revelation. And in a way, if Peter, having seen all of that, still needed the divine revelation of God to be able to make the statement, you are the Son of God, you are the Messiah, then I suspect, certainly personally, I suspect I need divine revelation. And I'm drawn to that, that verse in John, the first epistle of John, chapter 4, which is, um, whoever confesses that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And again, the Greek, the, the whoever confesses, if you look at the Greek, it's, the sentence structure is a bit odd. It seems to say, whoever if confesses Jesus Christ is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. It's almost like it's, it's not just whoever confesses, but it's, it almost implies whoever confesses with conviction that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And so this idea that Peter, despite everything he'd seen, wasn't qualified to make the statement, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, that he still required divine revelation. And if we look at scripture, what we find is that's also reinforced by, um, by other verses. You have a bit in, in John, uh, John chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus is recorded as saying, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. John 15, verse 26, coincidentally, also says, I will send the Spirit who comes from the Father and shows what is true. The Spirit will help you and will tell you about me. So this is Christ 
about to go to crucifixion and he's telling the apostles who'd been with him for years that he will send the spirit who will help them and tell them about him like they didn't know but scripture implies they didn't know or they couldn't know the fullness of who Christ is the completeness of who Christ is well if the apostles who'd been there for three years couldn't know the fullness of who Christ is and they needed either the Holy Spirit divine revelation apocalypto then surely we do and surely we should pray for it now here and here's the rub on that one okay if people in the first century who had Jesus present needed miracles to confirm the testimony about Jesus how much more do we might we need that when, when did that go away when did that need go away and Paul really rather confirms this in 1 Corinthians, let me check, 1 Corinthians 12. He says, um, uh, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God can say Jesus is accursed, but this this line, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. No one can say definitively Jesus is Lord unless it is granted by the grace of God, unless it is by the Holy Spirit, unless it is by Apocalypto, the divine revelation of God. And that seems to, those verses seem to support that. Now, we are not, we're not here, we're not trying to question the authority of Scripture in who Christ was. And in fact, I think, I think it's really worth being, you know, cards on the table here. Scripture is clear on Christ's status. Uh, Luke one thirty five says, The angel said to her, this is Mary, The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. So that's Luke in the very first chapter letting you know who Christ is. Mark does it in the very first line. Mark's chapter begins, Mark's, Mark's entire writing begins, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. So Mark's from the get-go is clear. The first chapter of John, so this is now three of the four Gospels, chapter one, uh, John um, talks of John the Baptist and says, and John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So three of the four Gospels tell you who Jesus is, the status of Jesus in chapter 1. The Epistle of John, as we mentioned, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given to us of his spirit and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son, Saviour of the world. And that's where he goes on to say, whoever confesses, whoever if confesses, that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. The second letter of Peter, who we're talking about in this film, says, I think it's, it's on the holy mountain, he says, For he received honour and glory from God when the voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Peter goes on to say, We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven, while we were with him on the holy mountain. So it's the transfiguration. The first chapter of John again goes on to say that one of the apostles, Nathaniel, answered and said to him, this is at their first meeting, Rabbi, you are the son of God, probably literally Ben Elohim, you are the king of Israel. And what I like is you also have all of these affirmations of Christ's status in scripture. You also have the account in Mark where it's not just the witnesses, but there's one point where the very voice of God declares Christ's status, and it's the baptism. 
In those days Jesus came from Nazareth and Galilee, and was baptized by John in the water. Just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart, and the Spirit descending like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, a voice came from heaven, the voice of God, You are my Son, the Beloved, with you I am well pleased. So there's no ambiguity in scripture, and there's no ambiguity in this film, about Christ's status as the Son of God. I'm not suggesting that. What I'm suggesting is that Peter, who had witnessed so much, when he was asked by Christ, who do you say I am? And he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That Christ said to him, you could not have come to this yourself, despite everything you've seen, everything you've witnessed, everything you've done, and all of the demons declaring it that you've heard, and the voice of God himself declaring it, you still needed the divine revelation, the apocalypto of God, to be able to make the declaration, you are the Messiah, you are the Son of the living God. Well, if that's true of Peter, how could that possibly not be true of us? So the prayer is very straightforward. For those of you who feel in the right place at this time in your faith, God, reveal to me who your Son is. Reveal to me who Christ is. Now, as I said, this is not a prayer to be taken lightly. I can understand people having reservation and, and that throwing them somewhat, and that's fine. Personally, I think this is a profoundly powerful prayer by my own testimony. When I first noticed this verse, or this, this, this incredible thing that Christ says of Peter, when I first noticed that, I started to, well, initially I started to research it, and then I started to pray it myself, obviously. And, and I prayed it as Christ suggested persistently, the parable of the persistent widow. I prayed it over and over and over again. And I guess at first, you know, I didn't notice much. And then over time, and it accelerated, I started to notice, well, firstly, it was like scripture itself started to come alive in a way I didn't expect. I think scripture says, you know, that scripture will be brought alive by the Holy Spirit. Well, that started to happen to me on the subject of the revelation of who Christ is, who Christ was, who Christ is. Scripture came alive. Then it was lots of what you call coincidences. It was meetings with people, conversations, many of them utterly unsolicited, coming round to who Christ is, who, the, 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 the fullness of who Christ is. Then it entered the realm of, of events. Um, I'd end up at, at um, workshops, sometimes not having a clue what I was turning up to, and it was about that, or if it wasn't about that, it led to that. And then I ended up with, I remember one uh, Christmas, I was sitting outside a local countryside chapel, and th th I'm not going to say too much about it, because I think I have to really be careful with it, but but the, there was something about the knowledge of Gethsemane, there was something about the knowledge of the Passion and why and, and what that meant, but there was also Christ's status on the cross. It was like what was being revealed to me and is continuing to be revealed to me is who Christ is. And it's not at all what I thought was going to happen. I think when I first started praying this, I may have had the, that sort of um, romantic idealized view that sort of, you know, the Robert Powell character was going to come out of the, the mist, you know, looking all sort of angelic and holy, and that was going to be what happened. Well, um, thank goodness that didn't. What actually happened was a much, what is happening is a much deeper, more thorough, at times more breathtaking sometimes subtle, sometimes slow, and sometimes fully um, revelationary and in my face, understanding, and I'm, I don't think I'm anywhere near 
a full understanding. And what's happened to me so far has been breathtaking, but uh, the beginnings of an, and I feel like I'm always at the beginning, a be- the beginning of the understanding of who Christ truly is. And, you know, I think to finish up, God, reveal to me who your son is. Reveal to me who Christ is. And I'm immediately, I can't help but right now I'm thinking of the first chapter of Hebrews. In fact, I'm thinking of the first line of Hebrews. Um, the, um, just by your son whom you appointed heir of all things, and through whom also you created the universe. That's first Hebrews. That's the first few lines of Hebrews. Whom you appointed heir of all things, and through whom also you made the universe. Hebrews goes on to say, the sun is the radiance of God's glory. The radiance of God's glory. Reveal to me who your son is and the exact representation of his being. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Father, reveal to me who your son is. This is no small prayer. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Sustaining all things by his powerful word. Father, reveal to me who your son is. This is not a small thing. This is, this is a significant prayer. This is a powerful prayer. It's based on the premise that even Peter and the apostles who were in Christ's presence for three years, that that alone, all that witnessing, all those signs and wonders, all of those revelations, that that wasn't enough for them to come to the understanding of who the fullness of who Christ was and is on their own, that they still needed the divine revelation of God. Therefore, you know, as you know from from previous films, you know, from the book of Jeremiah, if you call on me and come and pray to me, I will listen to you. And whatever you ask in my name, I will give you. So, in the name of God, reveal to me who your son is. That's a powerful prayer.